Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Art of Polymers. I'm David Ibbett, Director of Multiverse Concert Series. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. We're a nonprofit dedicated to sharing art and science in live performance. Uh, tonight, we're here to celebrate the 100-year anniversary of polymer science, and we're thrilled to be collaborating with presenters from the Monet Research Project from Duke and MIT Universities together with Scott Barton of the WPI Music Perception and Robotics Lab and cellist Min Jin Chung. Polymers are all around us in both natural and artificial forms. And our way of life depends on them to provide us with manufactured goods, clothing and musical instruments. Their story is a complex one with many environmental challenges to overcome. And tonight we want to share with you a vision of the future of polymers and the work underway to discover materials that are more resource efficient, degradable, and displaying remarkable properties that enable the technologies of the future. 
This is the work of the Monet Project, and they're joined by musical performances that explore not just the scientific themes, but the deep societal meaning of the work being done. We'll now begin our show. Uh, we have a Q&A feature, so if you have any questions, uh, you can enter them now, uh, and we'll either get to them in the chat, uh, you can question anybody you see tonight, and we'll have a special time for Q&A at the end. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremiah Johnson of MIT. Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to start uh, tonight's performance with a question. What is a polymer? And I'm sure to many of you, the word polymer means different things. Uh, but to chemists, polymers are materials that come from molecules that we refer to as monomers. Now, molecules are are very small, as you probably know, on the order of about a nanometer in size, which is a billionth of a meter. But over many decades, chemists have developed reactions called polymerization reactions that allow us to take monomer molecules and connect them together into long chains where each monomer molecule is connected by a bond, thus providing a new larger molecule or a macromolecule that is the key component of a polymer. Now, macromolecules are larger than the monomer molecules used to make them, but they're still very small. But if you could zoom in and look at a sample of macromolecules, you would see that they look an awful lot like a bowl of cooked noodles, where each noodle in the bowl is an individual macromolecule, and the macromolecules being flexible chains are all twisted around and entangled with each other, leading to a very complex and heterogeneous three-dimensional structure. It's actually this complexity that leads to many of the fascinating properties of polymers, but also leads to many of the challenges that we'll talk about later in today's performance. So polymers are all around us, um, but many of those polymers are actually used as polymer networks, which is another term here today. So I want to define it first here. So polymer networks are materials that are made by taking many individual macromolecules and linking them together with new bonds called crosslinks. Crosslinks can be strong bonds or they can be weak bonds. But the take home message is that by connecting many macromolecules together, we can take these small objects and produce arbitrarily large materials. So polymer networks could be anywhere from say tens of nanometers if only a few macromolecules are used to make them up to many, many meters, which lead to many of the materials that you interact with on a daily basis. For example, some of the uses of polymer Polymers and polymer networks that you would probably think of are shown on this slide. Uh, food packaging, plastic bags, containers for holding household goods, water bottles, toys, automobile components like tires, plastic straws. But you know these everyday uses that you may think of may um, obscure the fact that polymers are much more ubiquitous than this. And I like to show this uh, uh, through this stock photograph of a room in a home. And I imagine wherever you're sitting now, if you look around the room or the environment that you're in, I would wager that many, if not most of the objects that you're looking at are actually made of polymers and polymer networks. For example, in this room, I've shown or highlighted with orange asterisks, the different objects that are made of polymers or polymer networks. For example, the paint on the ceiling and even the structural materials used to make the ceiling and the walls, the textiles used to form the sofas and the rugs, the outdoor furniture, the television casing here, all of these are made of polymers. But there are other objects in this image made of polymers that maybe you haven't thought about before in that context. For example, the, the wood floor, this plant in the back corner, which I'm assuming is a real plant. If it's not, it's also made of polymers, uh, but let's assume for now that it's real. All of these are natural polymers or biopolymers. And one major component of these types of polymers is a polymer called cellulose, which here I show using the chemical notation that we use in the field of organic chemistry to indicate the chemical composition of molecules and macromolecules. Cellulose is a polymer composed of repeating monomer units of the molecule glucose, which many of you have likely heard of as a key energy source for, for living systems. Nature has developed ways to take glucose molecules and link them together, repeating units to generate polymers that have very strong interactions with each other, AKA crosslinks, to give highly robust materials like wood. Okay. So now while cellulose is the most abundant natural polymer on earth, 
there are many other very important natural polymers that I'd like for you to be aware of. And in fact, we are made of polymers and polymer networks. Two of them that you're very familiar with are shown on this slide. DNA is in fact a polymer of nucleotide monomers. And remarkably, the sequence of those monomers is what stores the information that gives rise to all of the function of life. So it's our genome. Next time you hear someone say, we sequence the genome of this, this animal or this person or this virus, what they're doing is determining the sequence of monomers in a polymer. Similarly, proteins, molecules you've certainly heard of, proteins are polymers of the monomers called amino acids. And you've probably heard of those as being important nutrients. Now, though your body needs these amino acid monomers because it needs to make polymers from them. And remarkably, your body and other living systems have developed polymers like this one shown called the ribosome, which itself is a polymer that is designed to make new polymers, to make new proteins from a polymer template called mRNA. So biology really heavily relies on polymers. Now, stepping outside of biological polymers, synthetic polymers, polymers, for example, made in an organic chemistry laboratory and polymer networks enable modern technologies. For example, next generation green energy harvesting, transportation, and therapeutics all depend heavily on synthetic polymers. And just one example I'd like to note for this evening is one you should be very familiar with uh, uh, given the recent times, and that is of the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Moderna and also Pfizer and BioNTech. This vaccine, as you've probably heard, is an mRNA vaccine, which I've already mentioned, is itself a polymer, mRNA. Um, and what this mRNA strand does is it goes into your cells and instructs your cells to make proteins, which I've already mentioned are polymers. But it should be noted that mRNA itself is not very stable in a biological system. So scientists and engineers had to develop a way to package these, these mRNA polymers in small nanoparticles that are themselves considered as supramolecular polymers that have polymer strands attached to their surfaces called polyethylene glycol. So next time you hear or think about the COVID-19 vaccines, just think about it as a polymer wrapped inside of a polymer coated with another polymer whose sole purpose is to go into your body and deliver information to cells so that they'll start making new polymers to give you immunity against the virus. Now, um, polymers have been around a long time. As David mentioned, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first proposal that polymers could exist. In fact, that was in 1920, so we're a little bit past that now. The question is, what is left to do? And indeed, um, even prior to 1920, Bakeland, or presented the first commercial polymer network even before people knew what polymers were. And Staudinger in 1920 proposed that polymers could exist and later won a Nobel Prize for that proposal. But despite this very long history, there's still a lot of things that we simply can't do well with polymers. And it all goes back to the, this heterogeneous cooked uh, bowl, a bowl of cooked noodles where the each individual noodle is uh, present in a complex, twisted way that we still don't have good ways to control at the molecular scale. And just to highlight that in a little bit more detail, some of the features that we would like to control, but we still can't with, with great precision, things like inhomogeneous network density. These are just random fluctuations in the density of where molecules are in space at a given time. And these density fluctuations actually lead to major changes in material properties that we still don't have a great handle on controlling. Things like molecular entanglements, the way these, these molecules twist around and get wrapped up or tied in knots with each other, or unreacted functionalities where individual polymer chains don't properly connect to the next chain over in a network, or loop structures where individual polymer chains connect to themselves instead of to the next macromolecule over or the branch functionality, which defines how many polymer strands emanate from a single point within a polymer network. All of these features, while we know that they're very important for defining polymer properties, are still challenging to control. And therefore, the future of this field involves linking molecular structure to large scale function of polymer networks to enable next generation materials and to truly enable predictive power over the function of new materials. Another way of saying this is to say that the future of polymer networks is molecular. So ironically, as we try to make these larger materials, 
we want to control them at smaller and smaller length scales. And since chemistry is the science of molecules and macromolecules, that I can safely say that the future of polymer networks is chemistry. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Monet, which is the Center for the Chemistry of Molecularly Optimized Networks, which is the National Science Foundation Center for Chemical Innovation. Monet comprises five principal investigators from three different institutions, Steve Craig and myself, whom you'll hear from this evening, Julia Callow at Northwestern University, Michael Rubenstein, also from Duke, and Brad Olson, also from MIT. And the goal of Monet is to transform polymer and materials chemistry by developing the knowledge and methods to enable molecular level chemical control of polymer network properties for the betterment of humankind. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. So uh, for those of you who know me, I, I'm David and uh, I direct the Multiverse Project. Um, and we get to do a lot of different work with different science labs. Uh, but it's, it's a particular uh, pleasure for me to get to work with, with Monet. Um, some of you may know that my father, um, Roger Ibbett, uh, back in uh, England, is a um, materials chemist. And uh, I grew up around his work. And although I decided to go into music, um, I guess it must have rubbed up on me. One of my favorite childhood memories is of a board game he made for us uh, with his work colleagues. Uh, it's called Mad Molecules. That's a sort of alternative title for tonight's show. Uh, and you can see what you have to do. I love board games as well, actually. Uh, you can see that you've got the uh, atomic numbers and the valencies and you, you, you build your molecule out of tiles and you get points and you try to get the biggest one. Well, that stayed with me uh, and came back to my mind uh, as I came to start writing polymer music uh, for tonight's event. So I'd like to share a piece with you uh, inspired by polymers and the plastics, uh, the, the several revolutions uh, that we've had through the 20th century uh, of polymers and now happening again through projects like Monet. The piece is called Polycello and it's scored for nine multi-track cellos whose voices link together like atoms in a molecular chain. Uh, the melodic ideas of the music are sonifications, uh, that is to say, uh, data uh, translated into sound. Uh, and in this case, it's the four most common plastics uh, that we all uh, have in our house. Uh, each one has its own melody in the piece. Uh, we have uh, polyethylene or polythene, polythene pam, uh, if we know that Beatles song, polyvinyl chloride, which is just vinyl, that's what your records are made of polypropylene, and we all know polystyrene. Um, so later, I'm going to show you how I made these uh, molecular melodies. But for now, um, I'd like to introduce our cellist for the evening, Min Jin Chung, who's the star of the piece, uh, who's going to show you them and what they sound like. Thank you, David. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Min Jin. I'm the staff for more this new piece. Um, so before we share with you the final product, I wanted to actually play through some of these melodies you mentioned. So um, each of these four different plastics get their own melody. And the first plastic melody that you will hear is the polyethylene melody. And that one goes like this. <laughs> Polyethylene. Um, next one that will come up is the polyvinyl melody, which is this rising kind of figure that will end the opening section. And it goes like this. <laughs> polypropylene and you're going to hear this in the middle section as it builds up to the climax of the piece and this is how it goes <laughs> And then the last 
last of these melodies that you'll hear is the polystyrene melody, which at the very end of the piece. And um, it's really cool because David wrote it so that all eight of the cellos are going to be playing it at the same time at different speeds. So it's uh, going to be this multi-layered kind of exciting ending. And this is how that goes. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much. So that was Polly Cello. Uh, so I'm now uh, thrilled to introduce our next science presenter, Patricia Johnson from Duke University. Good evening. Hi. Hey everyone, I'm Patricia Johnson and I'm a student at Duke and I work within the Monet Center. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our work at Duke. So basically what we do is we make a special type of polymer. You might've remembered from before that polymers are basically these really long, big molecules. And I like to think of them as a chain. So if the chain is the polymer, then each link in the chain is an individual bond between two atoms. So it's really small. But if you pull on a material, you're pulling on this linear chain. So you add force, and if you have enough force, then you can break one of those links in the chain. You break a bond. If you break a bond, you break your chain. And if you break enough chains, then you break your whole material. But it doesn't have to be that way. So our lab, in collaboration with the Monet Center, makes these special molecules that are basically knots in the chain. They're kind of like loops, and we call them mechanophores. It's mechano because it responds to mechanical force. These loops are special because instead of like a normal polymer that breaks when you pull on it, the knot unties and you get a longer polymer instead of a broken polymer. So if you watch these two little blue flags, when you pull on it, they get further apart. And so they are, um, it's longer. This is how we draw our molecule. And it's uh, a special language chemists use to communicate with each other, like musicians use musical notation to communicate sound on paper. We call our mechanivore spire pyran or SP as kind of a nickname. So it has this special bond between oxygen and carbon that's weaker than all the other bonds in the chain. But if you follow this pink line, the chain is still unbroken through the whole molecule. And when we pull on that chain, that special bond breaks, the ring opens, and the chain is longer than when you started. This is the open form, and you can see this is where the bond between the carbon and oxygen broke. But if you follow the pink line again, the chain is still unbroken. If you compare the lengths of the starting to the finishing molecules, you can see this is the start and this is the end, and the end is longer. It also happens that this turns purple when it's open, which is cool because we can see where the force is. So you have this kind of ugly yellow material, but then you apply force and it's pretty and purple and kind of cool. You can also apply force by stretching the material. It's just kind of a different direction of force and it's reversible. So when you release the force, the bond reforms and then you can do it over and over and over again. This reversibility and the color allows us to use this as a kind of force tracker or a force sensor. So like these pores, we can see where the edges of these tiny pores are with this molecule. Some mechanophores release a small molecule when the ring opens, like an acid. In this example, the acid that is released goes on to do further chemistry and turn it a different color under UV light. Some mechanophores take two tries to open, there's two knots, and that kind of makes them really strong. And that's kind of the goal of this whole idea is to make these super strong, super durable, really useful materials. And so Steve and Jeremiah will kind of tell you about that later, but I'm done for now. So I'm gonna pass it back to David. Thank you, Patricia. So um, she set me up well here because the title of my uh, second and, and final piece uh, that I'm gonna show you tonight is, well, here's the Mad Molecules again, uh, the title, of my second piece is Unbroken. Um, and it's a piano solo piece I'm gonna play for you. So I'll just show you a little uh, about um, how I'm making these melodies. So we have musical intervals. Um, if you're a musician or a lover of music, uh, you'll know that an interval isn't a chance to get an ice cream uh, because we're all on Zoom now. We can just get an ice cream whenever we want. Um, an interval is the distance between two musical notes. 
So a very small musical interval uh, will sound like that. And you can have a wide one. Uh, the distance between two notes, and we measure those in uh, half steps. So I thought it'd be a fun game to match those half steps up to the uh, atomic number of some of these atoms and then join them together to make molecules. So you'll see uh, in this polyethylene melody, uh, you've got um, the uh, carbons with their atomic number six. And then either side of those, you see these small notes, we've got these two hydrogens sticking out. And then we put it all together. And it goes on forever and ever, like a, like a polymer chain. So that's how uh, the uh, polycello piece came to be. Uh, but I wanted to see if I could use this uh, method to uh, sonify a much more complex molecule. Uh, this is one of the projects that Monet is working on, and you're going to hear more about it later. Uh, it's called Poly BCD Co NAAMPS. Uh, there's some technical language there, but it's a very interesting shape. This is the molecule here. And look out for this sort of octagonal shape here. That's important. Um, what does it do? Well, here, here is it uh, as a gel being stretched. It doesn't look particularly remarkable. But of course, it does have remarkable properties. Um, that octagonal ring, that's carbon atoms, and it has this special unlocking property that you've heard about. You're going to hear more about uh, and what that means is every molecule in the chain has to break uh, before the entire structure breaks. Now, if you're like me uh, and you've got young kids uh, with plastic toys, you'll spend a lot of your life super gluing them back together after they snap in half. You know, maybe that's a fun part of parenting, uh, but that's sort of a, a common criticism of, of plastics. You know, they'll warp uh, or they'll they'll kind of shear. Uh, but in, with this substance, it has this amazing yielding property. So that um, ring will break. You'll hear more about it from the scientists. That ring will break, has to break in every one uh, in the chain before the chain gives way. Much greater strength. It's uh, lighter, stronger, more uh, fuel and resource efficient. We're going to need materials like this um, for our society in the future. I think you'll all agree. Um, so what does it sound like as a melody, you might wonder? Well, I'm going to draw my way around this molecule. So I have to sort of pick a path, and draw a line. So I start here. I went with middle C. And um, we have an oxygen, sodium. And now we get to go around the big ring. See that going up and down. Another oxygen. Oxygen. Each atom has its own unique musical interval and uh, well, there's some more stuff about it on our site. We get to listen to the molecule, but uh, the real thing is this piece is about strength uh, and how strength doesn't mean being rigid. I'm sure we all know uh, strength sometimes means being flexible, uh, yielding, and then um, gaining new strength, regenerating uh, and facing new situations, new challenges. So that's what this piece is about. Every time the harmony shifts, which happens quite a few times, uh, you'll hear um, new uh, adapting for new strength and regeneration. I just have a quick technical change.
That was unbroken. So we move ahead to our next science presenter. I'm uh, thrilled to be presenting uh, Steve Craig of uh, Duke University. So I love uh, I love listening to David's music and to Scott's uh, music that we'll hear in a little bit. But I I also uh, love hearing them talk about their uh, their creative process. And the the reason that I so enjoy hearing them talk about their own uh, creative processes is that it it reminds me of the creativity that I. I see every day when I'm working with Patricia or Jeremiah or others of our fellow chemists in, in Monet. And, and often that creativity starts by asking very simple questions like, like what if? So for, for example, uh, take this concept of, of a little mechanophore loop that Patricia introduced, um, which inspires us to, to ask the question, so what if? I made that loop a little bit larger or, or made it at the molecular level larger still. And what if I had not, not one loop on each of these chains, uh, but many? So that now as I pulled on that chain, those loops opening under force would lead to large changes in the length that a polymer strand could obtain and the overall stretch that, uh, um, that, it could, uh, uh, that it could accommodate on the molecular level. And the reason that we were really excited uh, as we started to think about this is, is illustrated in this, uh, in this image that I'm showing of a tire graveyard. So as some of you might know, there are about 250 million tires a year in the United States alone that end up uh, needing disposal. And the reason for that is that under the repeated use of those tires on the road, they eventually wear down so that they're no longer functional and need to be replaced. And then they end up in these large overwhelming, uh, overwhelming landfills. And that process of wearing down uh, and needing to be replaced is, is not unique to the soft materials and rubbers that are involved in, in polymers, it's present in almost every kind of flexible polymer network, um, including things like artificial uh, synthetic materials that are used in artificial knee replacements or the um, electronic skins and prosthetics of, of the future. And so these are cases where if we could find ways to just slow down the rate at which materials wear out, even by, by just a factor of two, that could have enormous implications either for quality of life or quality of the environment on the, on the planet. And we often think of these processes, I think, as being very physical, macroscopic processes, right? things we can feel with our hands and see with our eyes. And that's absolutely true. But at their heart, these really are molecular processes um, that involve behaviors and responses at the level of these individual small polymer molecules as Jeremiah introduced at the very beginning. And so let me walk you through uh, sort of this molecular view of what's happening as a tire or a implanted biomaterial is wearing down. Okay? Because that wear fundamentally means that I've got little pieces of material that are breaking off under repeated use. So I've got a crack or maybe many cracks within the material that are propagating and growing. And that crack is propagating through these long polymer molecules in this tangled mess of cooked noodles that Jeremiah in introduced. And as the crack moves from left to right, what I'd like you to do is sort of shift your perspective here and think about what's happening to the molecules that are involved. And so if I start with a polymer that starts off kind of a, a ways away from, that, uh, from the edge of that, of that crack, as the crack moves, right, now that polymer um, chain stretches a little bit. One that started out a little bit more stretch stretches further still. And there's one that was kind of right at the edge 
of that propagating crack tip that as the tip moves, it actually broke through a covalent chemical reaction where bonds are being broken, as Patricia introduced. Okay. And so this macroscopic physical process of polymer networks wearing down and no longer being useful really boils down to molecules stretching to their limits and then breaking. And so this drives another what if, right? So what if I take these polymer strands that have multiple loops on them that at a point when the chain would normally break, instead opens the loop to release length and allows that polymer chain to grow longer? What would that mean? And here's where another piece of creativity comes in because as chemists, as Jeremiah pointed out at the beginning, we're not limited to the molecular structures of the polymers of the past. We can actually design with atomic precision new polymer structures, such as this, uh, this repeating unit with a little octagon stop sign-like structure that David mentioned, we abbreviated BCD, that will respond by not breaking and tearing the chain in half, but at least at the level of an individual chain by opening up and releasing that stored length in which we're interested. And so what I'd like to end with here is one of the examples of how we're now trying to translate this and move it forward. Right? And so this is some work by Zi Wang in the, in the center. And on the left and the right are two hydrogels, which are completely identical in every way that we can measure with the exception that in one case, the polymer strands have these little ring structures in them. And in the other, um, they've, uh, they're made just of chains that, um, that would stretch and don't have that stored, uh, that stored length. And so I'm going to pick up a movie now where these, these, uh, these hydrogels have been stretched um, to the same extent. And what you're about to see is that the old fashioned polymer network shown on the right is now breaking. But at that same stretch, at that same strain in the, um, in the Monet network on the left, the hydrogel can uh, survives, can be stretched further and further and further until it breaks, but at a much, much later point uh, than, uh, than the sort of unmodified traditional kind of polymer network. And although this is a long way from being you know, a new material for tires or for biomedical implants, the, the level of uh, reduced fatigue and wear that is seen here should be enough to increase the lifetime of this hydrogel under repeated cyclic use by a factor of two or four, which if you think about that translating in the future to the rate at which materials hit landfills or the rate at which uh, people need uh, replacement surgeries, um, we think can have a big impact. And so uh, with that, what I'd like to do now is turn the floor over to Scott Barton of the WPI Music Perception and Robotics Lab. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. So my name is Scott Barton. I am the director of the Music Perception and Robotics Lab at WPI. Um, I'm a composer. I'm a musician but I also design and build and make music with musical robots. And that's certainly not something that I do alone. Um, I have many collaborators, many fantastic, talented, intelligent students um, and who work in my lab and also my collaborators with Expressive Machines Musical Instruments. So when I approached this collaboration, I was thinking about both of these roles. So as a, as a roboticist and an instrument designer, um, polymers have had an enormous impact on my ability and many artists' ability um, to embrace technology in new kinds of ways. So if we think about um, these you know, rapid prototyping, the materials that we make our machines out of are laser-cut acrylic. They're 
3D printed PLA. And so access to these technologies, and, and you've see, seen us really in the last 10 to 15 years, um, artists being able to, um, to approach these technologies to open up new creative paths, to explore new kinds of directions in their, um, in their art, in their artistic expression, which I think is incredibly, uh, incredibly exciting. So we have done this over the past um, you know, 10, 12 years. And so I have a number of robots which are behind me in my studio. Um, I'll introduce and you'll see them in my piece in a bit. We have to my left is Pan, uh, polytangent automatic uh, multi monochord. To my right is Scyther, which is a human playable robotic zither. And in the middle here, you'll see uh, some robotic percussion, and they actually feature some of the, the Spyro Pyron, which we've been hearing about tonight. So, so when I was thinking about this collaboration from the perspective as of being an instrument designer and builder, I was thinking, how can we integrate this materials, right? Force is at the heart of sound production, right? We use their forces that cause objects into vibration, and as they vibrate, they have these compressions of air that we ultimately perceive as sound. So, and we think about in an instrument, the, you know, the, on the bridge of a guitar, there's incredible, as we increase the tension of that string, um, we, we have these forces that are, that are applied to that bridge, applying forces to the string itself to change its vibrating length to create pitches. The membrane of a drum as it's stretched across a drum body is also involves these forces and these tension on these materials. So we, um, in collaboration with, uh, with the scientists that we've been hearing with tonight, and I should say give particular thanks to Patricia uh, with through conversations and messages and sending materials back and forth. Um, we've been experimenting with ways to integrate into the robot. So we've tried uh, some of the things I mentioned, putting the Spyro Pyron on the, um, as an anchor for the strings in a, in a string instrument. Ultimately, what we, uh, what we went with was using it as, this, as the Spyro Pyron in this, um, in this elastomer as the actual membrane for a drum. So behind me, you'll see um, these, these elastomers stretched across. So as we stretch the membranes across, we can actually see the purple show up in the, in the spiropyrin as a function of the tension that's on the, on the membrane, the drum head. Um, so that was pretty neat. So I'm thinking about the, the collaboration from that one perspective, about integrating these materials into, um, into the robots and into our instruments. But then as a composer, I'm, I'm thinking about ways to represent this molecule and its interactions in music. And what I was particularly interested in is, is the idea of this mechanophore, right? So a mechanophore is this four sensitive molecular unit that reacts to force in a constructive way, that it can give release color to tell us of the stress that is, um, is being, that it's being subjected to. Um, that even Stephen uh, has talked to a couple of times about the potential for these, uh, these kinds of chemical reactions to even heal, right? So I love that idea as a metaphor of something that I could explore in my composition. Um, I know there's some sort of high level themes that I'm thinking about philosophically as I'm, as I'm writing. Uh, about this fantastic complexity that's microscopic um, that, that we can't see. I tried to bring that into my piece with these sort of glitch percussive elements and those, these kinds of moments sonically that require kind of magnification as a listener. Um, I'm thinking about another theme is this relationship between organic and synthetic that um, certainly governs a lot of our, our you know, th those of us who are, are electronic musicians um, and acoustic musicians. Um, we have this sort of this connection between the two. So using some of these electronic sounds that are that have a sort of plasticky association, um, and then using real acoustic sounds too through the robots, even have, though having computer control of both, right? Um, thinking about the idea of repetition and recycling. So repetition is an incredibly important part of music. Um, and when we do that, we are taking sort of those materials, but they can also be transformed in that process. Um, and the kinds of interactions that exist between these smaller elements to create something that's emerging and more complex, right? So in this piece, you'll see, um, I'm really interested in this first idea, this ring opening, right? We apply tension to this, this material, and then there's this release, there's this birth of an idea, of a new musical idea that then gets transformed, right? So that's represented in the first section. Um, the second section was a sort of more literal uh, look at Spyropyrin. I will show you um, a little bit of my, um, about some of my compositional process here. So 
you'll see, so here's uh, just with some of the graphs that I use in my, my pre-composition and compositional process. I'm thinking about the different sections and you'll see in the yellow there, we've seen this, this skeletal structure before about spiropyrin, about how I can move around that. How about these single bonds and double bonds in terms of when we're moving a certain direction about how that could be um, you know, a, an ascending pitch. It could be moving the other way. It could be an inversion, right? Or something in retrograde or the bonds or double bonds having to do with sort of rhythmic character. Um, for all you engineers in the audience, yes, I do use draw.io for in my compositional process. So I hope you enjoy that. Um, so I'm thinking about, and then once we have force or it could be heat or UV light, um, this transformation of the spiropyrin into merocyanine, which, uh, which Patricia talked about, about previously, right? So, so I'm thinking more literally about the sonic kinds of, of representations of, of these elements and, and that process. So that's the, the second section. And then after another ring opening, we get to the third section of the piece, the primary section. Um, and that's when I'm really using that bowl of noodles for inspiration, where we have all of these tiny little entities, but they're individual and I'm thinking about their interactions and, and Jeremiah talked about some of them about density about entanglement about bridging about these loops and these kinds of interactions as they as they happen together uh, result in the structure these larger kinds of structures that have their own sorts of qualities um, and they can form these really emergent patterns that um, and sometimes and, and that comes through as order right um, when in the in the larger if you're looking at it from the sort of the macroscopic lens and that happens certainly rhythmically in, in the final section of the piece so those are some signposts. Those are some things to listen for in the work. The work includes these, these robotic instruments, as I said, as, as well as a lot of um, a number of electronic sounds. And please enjoy Mechanophore.
Well, um, I think we could all say how cool was that? Such an amazing uh, piece of music. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm back um, to, to close off uh, tonight's performance with a brief talk about some of the work that's going on in my laboratory, um, where we are interested in addressing some of the sustainability challenges that we face with plastics. So Steve and Patricia gave really nice introductions to how we might be able to enhance the properties of materials such that they could last longer. But what do we do with all of the plastics and rubber materials that are already out there that we need to be able to deal with and also will continue to be produced over the next several years? So this slide shows some statistics that um, you might find somewhat alarming, but these motivate our work. For example, as shown on the left, it's expected that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by mass, which is quite a striking um, prediction. And I think is something that of course, none of us would, would want. Um, moreover, uh, you might be wondering, well, what about recycling? Well, in fact, a relatively small fraction of plastics is recycled today, about 20% worldwide, but less than 10% in the United States. Moreover, these plastics that are recycled are almost exclusively types of plastics called thermoplastics, which by their very nature can be heated to a certain temperature and remolded and reused or reformed. There's an entirely different class of plastics called thermosets, or I should say polymer networks called thermosets, which constitute about 18% of all of the plastics and rubbers manufactured. But because of how they're made and the strong bonds between macromolecules in them, they're generally not degradable or recyclable. In fact, we can effectively say they're impossible to recycle. And so my laboratory at MIT is developing chemistry that enables the selective disassembly of thermoset polymer networks into valuable new and recyclable products. So the question is, how can we design such materials to degrade? How can we disassemble what are effectively infinitely stable polymers, not literally infinitely stable, but stable for many, many decades, if not centuries, if just exposed into the environment. Well, in order to answer this question, we targeted a, a, a material called polydicyclopentadiene. Polydicyclopentadiene, or PDCPD, is a high-performance industrial thermoset material. It has extremely uh, outstanding thermal and chemical stability, durability, and toughness and exceptional ballistic impact resistance. So it has many remarkable properties. However, because of the strength of all of the bonds in this material, it is not readily degradable, nor is it recyclable. Now, using the language of organic chemistry, which we've introduced earlier in the evening, I'll show you now the chemical structure of PDCPD. PDCPD, like I uh, talked about earlier, is a polymer network comprising monomers of DCPD that are polymerized using a technique called ring opening metathesis polymerization or ROMP. And this reaction connects many of these DCPD together, molecules together into large strands that become cross-linked together. But the key thing to note is the entire material is made only of carbon and hydrogen bonds. There's no oxygens, there's no nitrogens, simply carbon and hydrogen. And the strong bonds that uh, result from bonds of carbon and hydrogen in these systems make these materials very robust. And for example, this is a piece of polydicyclopentadiene that has been able to effectively stop a, a ballistic projectile, whereas many other types of plastics would simply shatter under such high nonlinear forces. So in my laboratory in the last few years, we've developed what we call cleavable strand chemistry, which is an approach that allows us to go in with molecular precision and, and ask the question, does it matter where we clip bonds in polymer networks in terms of our ability to disassemble them and recycle them? Specifically using this ring-like structure, you've seen many uh, octag octagonal rings today. This is another one here that we've developed that has this oxygen silicon oxygen linkage that we call a bifunctional silyl ether. The remarkable thing about this molecule is when you add it to dicyclopentadiene under ROMP conditions, you generate samples of polydicyclopentadiene that are just like the previous or the, the parent material, but now have these oxygen silicon oxygen linkages embedded within their strands. And we know from prior work in the field of organic chemistry, but these silicon oxygen bonds can be selectively cleaved 
in the presence of different reagents, for example, fluoride ions, which are the, the key ingredient in your toothpaste. So we can use fluoride almost like a molecular scissors to go into this material and cut just those silicon oxygen bonds. So the fundamental question we have is what happens if we do that? And Peyton Shea, a postdoc in my laboratory, went in and, and did this experiment and found really striking results. Namely that low numbers of cleavable bonds in the right place enable PDCBD degradation. So here are a series of samples that Peyton made where he compared just, just pure PDCBD with none of our additive to materials made with 5%, 10%, and 15% by volume of our silo or silicon containing uh, molecule we call IPRSI. Now these materials all look the same and, and you can take my word for it. If you hold them in your hand, they just feel like hard glassy pieces of plastic that you can't distinguish them. But if you expose them to fluoride ions, which again are very mild, we use them in our, in our toothpaste, um, uh, hopefully every evening, if not a couple of times a day. Um, what we find quite strikingly is that this sample of PDCBD without any of our molecule in it, uh, doesn't degrade at all as quantified here by the percentage of initial mass recovered. So we actually recover back after exposure to fluoride, all of the materials, not even more because it swells somewhat in the, in, in the fluoride solution. When we add two and a half percent of our molecule, it still doesn't degrade. At five, it degrades significantly, but, but quite strikingly, once we get to seven and a half percent or 10%, we completely dissolve away this material. Now, um, that's quite exciting, giving us a way, a, a, a chemical tool with molecular precision to clip apart these networks into smaller fragments. The next obvious question you might be thinking is, well, if we have to put these cleavable bonds into the material, does that hurt the useful properties of PDCBD? I already said it's, it's, you know, it has outstanding toughness and ballistic impact resistance and all these other features. Well, I'm not going to go go through the data presented on this slide in, in, in any detail, but the take home message of all of the plots you see here is that in fact, low numbers of cleavable bonds do not hurt the useful properties of PDCPD. For example, the stiffest, the strain at which it breaks, so how far you can stretch it before it breaks, it's thermal stability, it's ballistic impact resistance, which we were able to measure uh, in collaboration with Professor Keith Nelson in the Department of Chemistry at MIT. All of these features, uh, if you compare the non-degradable version to the degradable version we made, they're all the same. But now we have added this very selective ability to degrade the material. So what we, can we do with that? Well, I've shown you, or here I show you in cartoon form, a PDCPD network of these cross-linked macromolecules that have these yellow spheres, which are our cleavable silo ether linkages. We can take this material very under very mild conditions, cleave these yellow spheres to generate uh, oligomeric and macromolecular fragments that we can simply take, and, and here's, a, here's an image of a beaker filled with, with um, this material, which we can take and simply re-expose it to the conditions used to form PDCPD in the first place and generate recycled samples which have properties that are equivalent to, if not even improved compared to a new sample of PDCPD. So these two curves are, are what we call stress strain curves, which where we're measuring um, essentially the stress, which is the force we apply to the sample and how much it stretches, how much it strains. And you can see that these overlap these two curves. However, the recycled samples actually can be stretched even further and have a higher area under this curve, which means enhanced toughness. So we're very excited about this as a strategy to not only recycle, but potentially make new materials with some improved properties. Moreover, many of these kinds of thermoset materials, when they're used in um, advanced engineering applications, are not just used as plastics alone, but also with fillers that form what we call composite materials. Now, for example, a car tire is a black material. It's not black because of the polyisoprene or polybutadiene polymer network, it's actually black from carbon, from graphite that's used to fill it and make it a much tougher than the polymer would be alone. Well, oftentimes that filler, such as carbon fiber, is actually more valuable and less sustainable than the plastic itself. So you would really like to and need to be able to recover it and reuse it as well as the plastic. Well, this is where our ability to very mildly dissolve these, these uh, very strong polymers comes into play. So here, Peyton took a sample of pristine carbon fiber. 
embedded it into a sample of polydicyclopentadiene, forming a composite. And then by simple exposure to fluoride ions, he could dissolve away that, that plastic component, the PDCBD, recover the carbon fiber. And we were able to show that that carbon fiber is completely untouched at a molecular scale. So our ability to dissolve the plastic didn't hurt it at all. So, so to make what is actually a very long story short, this cleavable strand approach offers a general way to enable thermoset recycling that we believe can be quite enabling in the future and help us address this challenge of recycling what is otherwise really considered to be unrecyclable. And chemistry, as I've mentioned many times today, is the key to enabling this. So thank you very much. And I will turn the floor back over to David. I think it's clear we're going to need the work of Monet for the future we're all building together. That is our show. Thank you so much. I want to call all of our presenters and musicians, everybody up for a, a bow together. Let me see here. Everybody come along. Let's have a bow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we can hear you clapping, I promise. I promise. Um, so uh, I need to have a lot of thank yous to do here. Uh, I want to thank Peter Quinn, Jeremiah Johnson, Patricia Johnson, uh, Steve Craig, Tetsu Ushi, and Zi Wang of the Monet Project for sharing their science and inspiring us to make music. I want to thank our cellist, Min Jin Chung, and Scott Barton of the Worcester um, Music Perception and Robotics Lab, his stunning composition. So, um, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and for uh, supporting our work by coming, by donating. And um, if you want to stay in touch, that is a wonderful way uh, to get involved with Multiverse. Um, I will say uh, in a second, we're going to have questions. Um, but um, do join our mailing list at multiverseseries.org. Um, we're on social media, follow us on Facebook. Um, and I can say that the video from tonight's show and the music is going to be up on our YouTube. So we've had some questions come in, uh, but we've got time for more. Um, so please type them now. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, uh, for musicians or for scientists. Um, I've got a question to get us started here. Um, one of the science team can pick this. Um, are these new materials technically elastic? or uh, once the knot is undone, or does it go back? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So in the cases um, that I showed, the, the knot does not reform. But the ones Patricia showed with the color change, it does, it goes, goes back and forth. Um, I'd say for the one, the, like the hydrogels that are tougher and more stretchable, um, they, they do recover their initial shape uh, very well. And, and in fact, sort of the, the slow loss in mechanical properties uh, that, um, that you get when you stretch them, sometimes they're not quite as strong, the second stretch or the third stretch, that's less than in kind of the traditional, uh, the traditional networks that don't have this um, stored length release. So this is, yeah, these are very much the kinds of fundamental questions that we're, we're probing and are very interested in. Yeah, and also in the bulk materials, like the gel or that little piece of plastic that I showed, um, when you stretch it or hit it, every time you do that, it's only like maybe 1% of those molecules that's getting activated. It's really hard to tell how many, but we're thinking about 1%. Um, so you still have a lot left over every time you do it, even if it doesn't reverse. I've got a question here uh, for Scott. What is, was the motive power of the robotic instruments? So these particular instruments are um, electric. So their electric solenoids are, um, are the fretting and uh, mechanisms for both PAM and, um, and also the exciting and damping uh, actuators for Scyther. Um, and they're also part of the, um, the robotic percussion instruments. Uh, we do build uh, instruments in the lab with, uh, with new, that are pneumatically powered that use compressed air. Uh, they are very large. It requires an industrial compressor, so those are not in my house. But uh, yeah, these are electric. 
We've got a follow-up one for you, Scott, actually. Um, do you compose the music yourself or is AI used to compose some of the music? So yeah, the whole, actually, I didn't mention this. The, that last section of the piece was algorithmically composed. Um, and so the process was, um, so I wrote algorithms to, that would produce these different, uh, these different chains, right. Um, that were interacting with each other. Um, and then because I can, cause I'm a human, I went in and I curated and I sort of selected the ones that I liked. And so it was this, uh, it was basically an interaction between the algorithms, the output of the algorithms that I wrote, and then things that fit sort of my own, um, you know, aesthetic preferences, uh, as a composer, um, so yeah, that was the last section. I've got one for the science team here. Uh, is the fluoride-based process to degrade the plastic scalable to the quantity of plastics that would be needed to be recycled? Yes, uh, thank, thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, actually, I, I, I failed to mention in my presentation that one of our um, motivating factors behind this project is to not only develop new chemistry that can work in this context, but but make it simple and, and, and low cost enough that it could actually be used in the near term to address this so sort of exponential increase in the production of plastic that's occurring today. So, um, you know, while I demonstrate using fluoride ions to dissolve these plastics, I, I think I mentioned that these silo ether linkages can be cleaved with other reagents, including um, mild acids and even mild bases. And so we, there are actually a number of options for how we can degrade these materials. But um, fluoride is not um, completely out of question. In fact, there are a number of industrial processes that use fluoride for a, for a number of applications, including in production of household chemicals. And so I think that that route may be feasible, but if not, we have um, many other options. And I should note that one of the advantages of being able to degrade these materials with relatively small loadings of our new monomer, you know, seven and a half to 10%, is that then, you know, if that new monomer is a little bit more expensive, we're still adding it in only a fraction of amount. So uh, we've already been able to scale this molecule up to the kilogram scale, um, which we think will be quite enabling, particularly as we start to uh, uh, collaborate with industry to do some larger scale testing of these materials. Thank you, great, great question. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, you can pop them in. I think I'll just take this moment to announce uh, the next two multiverse shows, which are uh, coming up. We've got one in February on the 14th and Valentine's Day, uh, all about neutrinos. That's with uh, Fermi Lab. So what better day, what better way to spend your Valentine's Day with some uh, particle physics and music and visual art. And on the 20th of March, we're part of a large uh, uh, online festival about exoplanets art and science, uh, 20th of March. Um, that's an ambitious new uh, venture that we're, well, now we've been in kind of this lockdown world for a while, we decided to go big and um, international with our collaborations. Uh, well, I, I actually um, I have a question uh, for, for Minjin, because uh, we've, uh, you know, we've met very briefly. Uh, wh what's it like been working on this project having entirely remotely so so we've we've been doing this all online and Min, Minjin is is very used to collaborating she hasn't met the science team we've been doing this whole thing over the over the web what was your experience like as a musician um gosh um yeah so i did i we met i met david once we were both wearing masks so i didn't have to see what he looked like until zoom <laughs> um and um, you know what? It actually, in some ways, felt easier. Like I could contact you, um, just logistically speaking, like just time-wise, it's easier to meet up on the internet sometimes. Um, and um, I mean, the only thing was the recording part was pretty tricky to do that, um, all the different parts. Uh, to, I recorded that in the basement of the house. And I actually did it at night. So I kind of turned into a night owl because plumbing goes through the basement. So if anyone like flushes or like washes their hands or something, like it just, you get a big wash of sound. So I didn't want to disrupt anybody and tell them that they can't use the bathroom or whatever. So I basically turned, I worked the night shift for a while. I did like recorded all those parts at night. 
um, and then just you know layered them all together. And then David did a really great job actually kind of putting some extra producer touches to it to make it the sound really come together. Um, but you know what? I, I felt like in the David really easy to work with. Um, you know, I, I feel like I had, yeah, I didn't really feel uh, they were the virtual thing was lacking. Like we lacked any thing in terms of collaboration. So, um, so yeah, but it was certainly interesting for sure. <laughs> We've all been making it work, haven't we? In different ways. Um, yeah. well, do you know, I've got one more question. Uh, Peter, who uh, didn't speak, but he made our first video. How long did it take to make a 3D printed cello? Two weeks for a two minute video. Not bad. <laughs> well, I think that's it from us. Uh, join us uh, in February or in March for future events. Um, this is stage one of the Art of Polymers and we will be back with more from Monet, more music, more robots in the future um, from Multiverse and Monet and WPI. Good night.